Well, I'm delighted to be here with Shia LaBeouf today. And uh, you and I met when, several months ago when you were up in my pastoral region working with the um, Capuchins to prepare for this extraordinary role you played of Padre Pio. Mm -hmm. So I ran into you up there one day. Mm -hmm. And I just saw you a few weeks ago when you were premiering the movie for some of the uh, Capuchins. So mm -hmm. delighted you're here today to talk to us. I'm and, honored uh, to be here. Good. And several, I mean, I could talk to you all day about a lot of things, but uh, maybe first a bit about, about acting. I mean, you're... You're seen as one of the best actors in your generation. And when I watch your films, I'm reminded of people like, you know, De Niro and Pacino and, and Daniel Day-Lewis and some of these people who are, are more identified with, you know, the method acting style, Stanislavski and all that. I'm just wondering, I mean, do you agree with that? Would you say you're kind of a method actor? And if so, what, what's involved in that? I think people put that on me, but uh, yeah. and, and and I'm honored by the the people you just mentioned to be included that way or be perceived that way. Yeah. But uh, one, I'm not at that level. One, two, I I'm not in that school of thought. So, Stanislavski uh, is about sense memory and um, it's it's very intellectual. Hmm. It's, a, it's a whole lot of um, uh, conceptual. It's a whole lot of um, cognitive. It's heady. It's very heady, hmm. and I'm I'm like a Whitman character. I'm like a very <laughs> unintellectual feeler, and so I I don't I don't identify with that school of thought really. I don't really know what I do or what where where it comes from or how it happens. I know that I I feel a whole lot. I got a big heart. I don't know if I'm a method guy. Yeah. I, um, and I think some of that stuff's ridiculous. So like kind of the staying in character. That's sort of the. I like, I like to be immersive. Yeah. I like all immersive experience, not yeah. just acting. It's probably why I like Catholicism as well. I like yeah. all immersion. I like being fully, I like adventure. And that requires like full immersion. So I, I would consider myself an immersive actor, but method acting has like a bad um, smell to it. Like too technical, too intellectual. And just kind of kind of douchey, or... kind of like, just like mean. You know, mean. yeah. How's Sometimes mean? I feel like there's um, people on on film sets like they um, it gives some people an excuse to behave uh, terribly. Yeah, okay. You know, you hear some <laughs> stories of guys just like sending people like rat carcasses and you know like ridiculous things that have nothing to do with the moment on set. Um, What's the famous Olivier story that he's with Dustin Hoffman, yes. right? And Hoffman stayed up all night and to you know get totally into the, his character and didn't Olivier say like um, why don't you try, just try acting, acting my son? It's a lot easier, yeah. you know. Well, yeah, and 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 this is tricky because both of those actors are incredible. You know, who would you side with? Me personally, I, I appreciate Hoffman more, mm -hmm. and maybe that's just because my generation. But uh, I, I don't think it's required to. Uh, first off, I, I, I now having played Pio, some of the penitence involved in Method is interesting because yeah. then you're not acting. I hate acting. I hate acting because it feels like like um, you can get it wrong when you're really in it. Um, then you can't get it wrong. I hate losing, hmm. you know? I like to win. And so there's ways to like backstop a performance where you leave yourself very little room for error if you're in the middle of it, you know? Um, if you show up with all the caps, it's, it's easier to, to believe and uh, that you're a part of that because you showed up with it uh, equally. If you're playing a gangster and you roll in with gangsters, it feels the same way. Whereas... Um, the make-believe stuff feels like frivolous and uh, unintrinsic and like wishy-washy. So say a bit about your own preparation then. So not the intellectual Stanislavski thing, but uh, this immersive entering into the emotion of it. Tell me more about that. You're preparing to play Padre Pio. You know, what's involved in that? Yeah, because Stanislavski is like therapy. It's like yeah, therapizing, okay. right? Which yeah. is really heady. Yeah. And let's focus on childhood trauma and the problems and things like that. Um, I, yeah, I, so, okay, P.O., right? So you, you wind up with uh, this em enormous responsibility. Yeah. And you learn how enormous it is the further in you go. And you start to get very scared. And that fear motivates, like all things, fear, fear and discomfort motivates, like, growth and change. And mm -hmm. so you, I uh, get this, um, uh, I'm tasked with this enormous thing, which feels like, and this is a whole story in itself, how the role even came to me, but um, which also feels miraculous and, and unearned. And, um, and, and um, I, I, anyway, I wind up with this, this task. And the task is to play like one of the most spiritual men that ever lived. You're playing um, one of the most respected, beloved saints that ever graced the earth. 
some people in in you know Italy don't carry a Jesus on them; they carry a Pio <laughs> on them. Yeah, right. You go to certain places in, in Italy, and he's everywhere. He's Elvis, and um, I mean that in the best way. And um, you you recognize rightly that this is more than a role. That this is Pio is interesting because um, Pio also saved my life. I mean, it's it's not just like a like a movie or something like that. But and I don't mean that lightly. Um, Let, let's hang on to that. I want to get back to that, of course. Okay. I want to ask you maybe one more thing about about acting. Um, if you if you like immersive experiences and you get tasked with paying, playing Pio, yeah. your life is going to change. Well, I can get. I see that. Yeah, yeah. for sure. And that happened to you. Yeah. Here's what I want to ask you about, though. Actors have been fascinating to us from ancient times. It's not like a Hollywood thing. It goes all the way back to ancient times. The people loved actors. They find them fascinating. For some reason, people that can play other people we find compelling. And then even like the ancient philosophers were very interested in, in acting and theater, you know? Can I interject for one second? Yeah, go ahead. Just to say that mass is a bit of a performance. Yeah. Mass, you are, the priest is performing the last moments of Christ's life, and he is a vessel for this in, extraordinary experience, this extraordinary moment in time, and he is replaying these, this, when, as he's, imbuing the, as the host is imbued with the spirit you're that is a bit of a performance and so different priests have different performances and there's a not to say a priest is an actor because that somehow minimizes the sacred nature of the task but there is a correlation between um mass and um and being an actor uh completely immersed in an immersive experience mm -hmm. that was my first inroad yeah to pio was okay that mass is an immersive experience he's fully involved his mass was very different than other masses that were performed uh in that it was it was lively it was uh it, you never knew which way it was going to go we have some films of those we've seen padre pio yeah saying that. and and it's a, an emotional experience it's not just the tradition of it it's not just the ritual of it it's it's um it's an entire journey that he goes through. He's exhausted at the other end. He's sweating. He's dripping. He's crying. Yeah. There's snot. It's like the man went to battle. He went to war, and it feels like like there's a death that happens and a resurrection. And it's it's um extremely emotional, which is how he touched people. He didn't touch people through like these profundities that he spit. He was a, a, also an immense feeler. Uh, he, you know, a lot of his contemporaries didn't liken him to an Aquinas or an intellectual. He was an, ex an extraordinary feeler. He was like a pro feeler. And that was my first inroad to him was the fact that I, I as an actor yeah. who feels that way, that I'm not like an intel. I didn't go to school. I didn't go to Juilliard. I'm just like a, a street tough who wound up in this wild world. And in Pio, I found the same kind of misanthrope who wound up in this wild situation where a lot of people put a lot of pressure on him and he felt the enormous nature of the task. That was my first inroad. Yeah. Sorry for speaking too much. No, no, here's a, a lot of things were going through my mind as you were talking. One is, I heard Bruce Springsteen say one time that his first introduction to performing was being an altar server. So he's in this Catholic parish, he's an altar boy, and he said, there you are up on this stage that's well lit and there's people out there and you're dressed up. And he said it was like my first introduction to performance. I also thought yeah. of, Thomas Merton, you know that name? Oh, yeah. The spiritual writer. Oh, yeah. So Merton had all these friends in New York who were not Catholic, and he becomes a Trappist monk, which is mm -hmm. a pretty, you know, intense mm -hmm. expression mm -hmm. of Catholicism. So a lot of them came to his first mass, and they didn't quite know what was going on. So one of his buddies, a guy named Seymour Friedgood, who was Jewish, said, what is the mass? And Merton said, well, it's like a ballet with certain mm -hmm. prescribed movements and gestures. Mm -hmm. Now, that was the pre-conciliar mass, the older mass, mm -hmm. which probably is a little bit more like that, you know, mm -hmm. it's just... But it's to your point about the performance of it or the drama of it, because it is a sort of recapitulation of the drama of Christ's life. Mm -hmm. Even the priest coming into the sanctuary, the, the, the word entering into flesh, coming into the world, the priest being relatively silent for the first part of Mass, the, the quiet, the mm -hmm. silent years of mm -hmm. Jesus. Then the procl proclamation of the word, that's Jesus preaching. Mm -hmm. You know, Then there's the sacrifice of Calvary, etc. Mm -hmm. So the, the Mass is a if you want a dramatic representation of the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. Also, when Mass is done really, really well, you feel like some, like a secret is being shared with you. Mm -hmm. And good performances are this way. When you see really good performances, you feel like, oh, wow, this person is sharing a secret with me. It's, yeah. It connects in something deeper where you feel like somebody is expressing something from in you and you're seeing it uh, up on screen. And, and that's what I get out of really good Mass. 
a really good mass feels like it's sharing some secret with me, some profound secret with me. Hmm. Um, not to get too corny or anything like that, but that's yeah, what but it, Let me ask you about that, because that was my, my question about the philosophers. I won't get too technical, don't worry about that. Uh, but like Aristotle said, theater is cathartic. And what he meant was, that means just like cleansing. Mm -hmm. Catharsis means like a purification. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As I watched the actors on stage, he thought, and especially it was, it was pity and fear and sorrow, these deep emotions we have, that we kind of act them out with the actors and we sort of mm -hmm. deal with them. And you know, we post-Freudian people get that too, of like deep emotions in us that might be suppressed, but they're coming out as we're watching a great film or a great play. I mean, do you do you see that or what what's the what's happening when you're watching a really good movie beyond just entertainment? Yeah, you're activated. It's probably why mass has changed. You know, ma the, the the mass has changed because there was a yearning to activate the public hmm. in an artificial way. And I would say, I mean, listen, I'm not no expert on any of this, but it feels like this bureaucratic activation uh, like rules were set or a change happened in the tradition from Latin Mass to the Mass that you now receive at a traditional Catholic church, it's almost as though the church is trying to, 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 um, uh, to from the, fr almost from the office, activate the audience without putting the agency on the priest. We have full conscious active participation. That's Which the, is where the, the singing and the back two. and forth comes right. from, whereas old Latin Mass put all the agency on the priest to be fully activated. And that at that activation of the priest was supposed to activate the audience, to activate the the, uh, the the laity. That all the agency was put on the priest. And so, and and I don't want to get too far into this because then you get into controversy. But Latin Mass affects me deeply, deeply. And, How and come? Because it feels like they're not selling me a car. Hmm. And when I go to some mass with the guitars and stuff, yeah. and I'm from, you know, Santa Inez, right? So that's where I was catechized. And there's a lot of guitar playing. And there's a lot of like what feels like, um, like they're trying to sell me on an idea. Yeah. Whereas what I feel when I went to Oakland and went to like, um, and, and by the way, there's a very incredible version of that as well. That's super activating and very emotional that I've experienced up there with Father Bobby. There's also, and Father Peter, but there's also this, Something that happened, you know, Christ the King in Oakland does a Latin Mass every day of the week. And it feels like it's, it's not being done to sell me on anything. Mm -hmm. it, and it feels almost like, like I'm being let in on something very special. And the quiet, uh, um, the, 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 it, it, it activates something in me where it feels like I found something. It's a little bit like a band. Mm -hmm. When a band is pushed on you, uh, you, it doesn't feel the same way as, as you finding it. When you find it, then you root for it. It feels like this special thing that you found and you protect it and you hold it and it's yours. When somebody's yeah. selling me on something, it, it somehow yeah. takes my, it kills the, the, my, my, my um, aptitude for it and my suspension of disbelief and my yearnings to root for it. I'm, no, I, I, I get it. I, there's an immediate rebellion in me. Yeah. Yeah. No, I get that. You're hitting different dimensions of it, you know, because you might say the shadow side of the older form was it became too much of a theater performance and the audience is just kind of sitting there taking it in, where what all the liturgical reform people wanted, this is way back in the, like the 40s and 50s, was this full, conscious, active participation so that the, the congregation is not like just watching a show, but were involved. You say the give and take and so on. Uh, but then the shadow side of the other approach I think you're right in saying I can feel too put upon, like they're, as you say, trying to sell me something. Yes. And, you know, so trying to find that organic rhythm. Because you don't want to be exclusive either. No, right, right. Which is what Latin Mass feels like sometimes. It feels like, like I have to know Latin to experience mm -hmm. it. But however, I would also say that there's certain language where I don't need to know the words. Yeah. Which is what I, what I feel when I watch Pio's Mass. Yeah. I know what's going on. Uh -huh. and I feel it deeply. I, it almost feels more powerful than when I know every single word. It takes me out of the w realm of the intellectual, and it puts me squarely in the realm of the feeling, the and the beauty thing that you talk about. Do you know uh, Joseph Campbell? Do you know that name? The yes. Comparative mythologist, and he was raised as a Catholic way back when, so in the old church, right? He said he thought the greatest problem was when we move the mass from the older form, and he said to make it more like a, like a cooking demonstration. And what he meant was, oh, here we are, everything's well lit, I'm, gonna, I'm this and this and that. And you know, I, I get his point, it's kind of the point you're making, that if it becomes too obvious, too rationalized, too, hey everybody, look, here's what's going on, that it does take something away yeah. from
from the experience of yeah. the, the mystique of it. The because part of the idea of using incense, which we do at the Catholic Mass, and we say, well, our prayer is going up to God. Yes, indeed. But part of the symbolism there is it blocks our vision. The, the smoke gets yes. in the way. Yes. And in fact, it gets in your eyes even. Yes. Where people are coughing and I can't see. But that's appropriate around sacred things. If everything's wide open to view and under bright light, oh, there it is. Yeah. Well, that's by definition not the sacred in a way. Yeah. So, see, I, the, the challenge to me is trying to find a way to honor all these things we're talking about. And the liturgical wars going on are often people on both sides seeing good things in their approach. But it's trying to find the place where they can all find expression. Yeah. I think that's the challenge. Yeah. And, and I do, find, I mean, as a, as a person who's involved in the arts, to deny some of the senses, in, it heightens some of the others. So, yeah. so when yeah, you yeah. put me in this rationalistic, right. logical, word, 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 plot, 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 it takes me out of the feeling realm. Yeah. Whereas Latin mass puts me squarely in the feeling realm because I can't argue the word. Because I don't know what the word means. Yeah. So I'm just left with this feeling that feels sacred and connected. And really what, what hindered my, I was, I was never an atheist. I was always an agnostic. Even when I was a Sam Harris, Ted Talk, you know, Christopher Hitchens guy, mm -hmm. which is who I was before I fell in. Um, um, it, 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 um, I always had a belief, but I never had like a connection. Latin mass gave me something where I felt connected, uh, which took me out of belief into connection. Belief kept me, you know, I, I had belief because that's the rational, logical. It's not logical or rational to be atheist. If you really go deep enough, you get to the Big Bang and then, then you're screwed again. You know, you have to right. account for it somehow, which puts you in a belief situation. Right. But uh, too much of that logic and that too much of that rationale takes me out of feeling, which takes me out of connection. No, that, and that's, it's a good instinct because Catholicism, I think part of our genius is we never threw anything out. That We have kind of this all-encompassing thing. You want rationality, man. You got Thomas Aquinas, and he'll he'll he's more rational than anyone in the whole Western tradition. But then, that same Thomas Aquinas, who could write in a highly highly technical way, they say couldn't get through Mass without weeping copiously. Yeah, and so that's Catholicism: is that we've got the emotion, we've got the art, we've got uh, the the sensible, we've got the intellectual, and it's all there. We never threw anything away, you know. And so, because people are in different places. When I was a young kid, I responded to Aquinas' arguments. That they made a huge difference to me. Like, yeah. wow, that is really rationally compelling. Other people respond in very different ways. Mm. I responded differently at different stages of my life. When I, I got through that, and then other things opened up to me, you know. So I, I love that, that we've got this house with all these doors that are open. And, you know, come, whatever door works for you, come on in. You know? Well, Merton is really interesting because he's a poet. And yeah. he speaks really rationally, but his writings are, and he was an atheist. So if you walk in and you're, you were me reading, you know, Seven Story Mountain, uh, he spoke to every part of me. He yeah. was a big deal for me. Him and... Uh, he was for me too. Yeah. Uh, I didn't realize that you had read, so you read the Seven Story Mountain. It was sort of required if you were going to play Pio, I was told. He was a big it's deal. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, the guys who catechized me, all the guys at San Lorenzo gave me him and Jim Townsend. Jim Townsend was a Capuchin who... Formerly was a a con man. Oh, he was a gosh. convict. Yeah, yeah, he had yeah. murdered his pregnant wife, yeah. and then spent twenty years in prison, and then spent thirty five years in the seminary, or uh, thirty five years in the order. In the order, yeah. And and he was another um, he was another um, invite for a person who felt totally depraved when I walked in. You know, I walked yeah, into yeah. this. I, my life was on fire. I was walking out of hell. It wasn't like I you know I willingly came in here on a on a white horse singing. Uh, show tunes. I came in here on fire and, and I didn't want to be an actor anymore. And my life was a mess, complete mess. And I had hurt a lot of people and I felt deep shame, deep guilt. I didn't like to go outside much. I really, like, I had a, I had a, a yearning not be here anymore. You know, I was is on my it, way out. Is that where you were when you accepted yes. the role of yes. Peel? So this is why when you spoke about the role, I wanted to kind of dive in there because it's kind of formative to how this all happened to me. I was willing because pain made me willing to go about this in a different way than I had previously. You know, my, my whole, my opinion about God before this happened, before the pain struck, before my world had crumbled was art, love, and God, they all mean the same thing. They're synonymous. And as an artist who creates art, I found myself in a, in a, in a godly position often, right? Where I was in charge. And I had also been told my whole life, like, 
Your life is your life. You have to make with it what you can, you know? You gotta be a good guy and then you gotta get married and then you gotta get a house and you gotta get a job and do good at your job and like, your life is your life and yeah. things will work out if you put effort in and you know, um, it's up to you. And I always really felt that and it made it hard to believe in God because it felt like my managerial skills are what are going to amount to uh, a, a, a fulfilled existence. Yeah. When all of my designs failed, when all of my plans went out the window, when my life had led to serious infliction of pain and damage on other people, I threw up my hands like my plans are garbage and I don't want to be here anymore. And I have no, and I, that was required to enter PO. You had to actually, it's why it feels like celestial mathematics or some kind of divine, it feels way t you know, too uh, coincidental to be a coincidence. But my life was completely, like I told you, on fire. And I'm in a spiritual program where where I go on Zoom and I you know we we have meetings and another person that was in this meeting who's also part of this same fellowship of like the down and outs was a man named Abel Ferreira and he wound up seeing me in the meeting uh, we shared sensibilities we had heard each other share a few times and then he wrote me in the chat box do you know about Padre Pio hmm. and of course I didn't know anything about Padre Pio this is before the offer of the, of yeah, the film it's yeah. just, okay. he had been this had been gestating on his side for years because yeah, okay. his his grandfather comes from the same region in yeah, okay. uh, Pietro China and he has a connection to Pio in a, many different ways he's not a Catholic he's a Buddhist um, which I always had trouble with as a person who was always self 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 and now I'm not going to get into that conversation but me and him have wrestled over this many times and I thought okay well what is this Padre Pio thing and this is early days in my um my my what now looks like a salvific journey from my side yeah. um I was still egotistical on max I was still grasping at straws how do I hold on to what I've lost how do I build a career again how do I and so when he, when this director who I respected, I had known he made movies that I really loved. You know, Bad Lieutenant for me is one of the greatest performances ever made. And I know he's an actor's director. And the fact that there was this director reaching out to me, because at this point I'm nuclear. Nobody wants to talk to me, including my mother. The manager's not calling. The agent's not calling. I'm, um, I, I'm not connected to the business anymore. And so the fact that this man reached out to me felt like something like, in my egoic mind, wow, this is a miracle. This is my chance. This is my chance. This is my chance. Yeah. And so my ego shows up. And now I'm like, yeah, well, Padre Pio. And my ego is what makes me research Pio. It's not my Catholicism or my yearning so you towards God. thought this would be God. a cool role for me to play. Great. Okay. Now I can get back on the horse. You yeah, know? okay. And so I start researching Pio. And, and as I'm researching Pio, he tells me about his plans to make a movie. And he tells me that Willem Dafoe is going to be in the movie. And now I'm really an ego. Wait, so I can go from bottom barrel to working with Willem Dafoe, ah, this is my chance, you know, back on the hustle, back on the ego. Yeah, yeah. And I start leaning into this thing and he says, well, if you want to do this role, I need you to start researching, go up and find a, um, I need you to go find a seminary, a well, Catholic seminary. that's when seminary. you made your way up to Santa, uh, San Lorenzo. So, so the closest seminary to me, yeah, yeah. living in Pasadena <laughs> was San Lorenzo. So yeah. I drive up there and I park my truck and I start living in the parking lot. And I'm immersing myself in this world and I'm sending videos back to, him, to Willem and Abel, who at the time were, you know, working on the script, and I'm falling into um, a, a group of men that met me in San Lorenzo, namely a guy named Brother Jude, who starts talking to me about the gospel. And he says, well, if you're going to play P.O., you need to read the gospel. And so I'd never read the gospel, and he's reading Matthew to so me. So you'd never read, like, Nothing. the gospel of Matthew straight Nothing. through? Yeah, okay. I've read all Sam Harris. <laughs> I've watched all the TED Talks. Yeah, right. And was really good at attacking Catholicism, because it made me feel superior. It so made you were me feel kind of agnostic slash atheist at the time. Yes, I'd like to. I'd like to argue because right. it made me feel like I was in power. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'd like to be contrarian. Yeah. I'd like to sit with a bishop and then put you on your heels because that would make me feel powerful. Right. Uh, which I find most secular people enjoy the control of it. Yeah. Because so much of life is uncontrollable. To feel in control feels good. So uh, I was that guy. I come up with these arguments. My mother had a spirituality that was sort of undefined. She was Jewish, right? Your mother? Yeah, but, but like hippie Jewish, like yeah. uh, not like traditional Jewish according to yeah. the Testament. My mother had never read the Old Testament. Okay. She was Jewish in culture. She liked the art. She liked being a part of it. She liked um, uh, the rabbis and the charisma, uh, but she, she, she wasn't a, a practicing Jew yeah, in okay. that she wore to fill in and right. read the Old Testament. And I had never been 
given any of this information, never been, I've been bar mitzvahed phonetically. Hmm. I read the Hebrew phonetically. Okay. So it felt like a show. Yeah. It felt like a hustle. You didn't know what you were saying. I didn't know what I was yeah. saying. Okay. And in that way, it, it felt, and it wasn't emotional. It felt like I was doing it for my grandmother, who at that time was on her last leg, and I was told I needed to get bar mitzvah for my grandmother. And you were like 13 at the time? The 13, age, yeah. and, I, okay. and I, read, I read it phonetically, and my grandmother's happy, and they put me <laughs> on a chair, and that's my spirituality yeah, for a okay. long time. And it felt fake, because I never invested. There was never any, I had never felt any real suffering in my life. So I didn't have any willingness to have any belief. So I had no faith. Um, okay, so that's the- So now you're up at San Lorenzo, and you're, you're giving the Gospel of Matthew. I'm reading, reading Matthew. it for the first time. I read it for the first time, and things start to strike me, like like, this, like, Bap, like John the Baptist. Yeah. Okay. Like John, the story of John the Baptist, uh, being being a reformed hedonist, being this man who was wearing like this this who was sort of like you know scraggly and like kind of felt like a, a old Western character from some kind of like uh, like um, I don't know like he felt like like um, uh, he felt like a cowboy. Eating locust and wearing yeah yeah he felt he felt like kind of rustic and right. strong and masculine and yeah. my opinion of Christ at this point felt almost like I was reading about a Buddhist like this very soft fragile all loving all listening but no ferocity no romance well, then you hadn't read the gospel hadn't read the gospel at that point <laughs> I just had these this art that I had yeah, seen of right. like this very soft more feminized yeah Jesus. yes and so I hadn't had this idea of like a the Old Testament, Christ on a horse, cape dipped in blood, sword. I had no, uh, none of that was in my lexicon of knowledge. So all I knew about was this very soft, meek Jesus, which didn't fit into my idea of what, uh, like my, what masculinity would be. I come from like a, my dad was a Mongol biker, you know, it's like we, uh, it, it wasn't appealing to me. And then I read about John the Baptist and it became quite appealing. His, the, the grizzle, yeah, right. And then you get further into the gospel and you start getting into like elements of this like redemptive. It felt like I started reading about a route. I started like reading a map, like yeah. towards something that felt like um, let go. That's really what I got out of the gospels. If I could wrap it up in two words, it was let go. And at that time when I was reading it, I was holding on so tight to a life that I was slipping away through my hands to a... 35 years of management that the gospel gave me this um, this invite to just let go. What never was appealing to me about Buddhism was this idea like if I'm in a boat and the boat is sinking and I don't know how to swim, Buddhism is a book that tells you and uh, read this and learn how to swim better. And at the time of my life, like I didn't want to swim anymore. I had a gun on the table. I was out of here. Uh, I didn't want to be alive anymore when all of this happened. Okay. Uh, shame like I had never experienced before. It kind of shame, you forget how to breathe. You don't know where to go. You can't go outside to get like a, a taco. Like you don't want to go and anywhere. And that's where you are when you're up there reading the gospel and, and thinking about the yes. plain tide repeal. You're yes. in that state. Yes. But I'm also in this like, this deep desire to like hold on. Yeah. And so I read the gospel with this man, Jude, and I keep hearing like in many different variations of it. I'm not going to explain the whole gospel here, nor do I need to. It's you. But I, I keep hearing let go. Mm -hmm. And to a person who's been gripping so tight for so long, it feels like, ah, uh, uh, it just feels like, it's just, um, um, it just feels like the right move to let go, like s complete surrender for real. And, um, and it stops being this like prep of a movie and it starts being something that feels beyond all that. And I stop sending videos. Like at a certain point with Jude, I just like really fall in. And then I meet these, win these, these women, the Sister Lucia of the, uh, um, the uh, uh, um, Sacred Heart Sisters, who starts really like catechizing me in a very real way, in a very like, let's go through it, let's talk about it paragraph by paragraph. And what happened was there also happened to be like a meeting at the church for this other spiritual program that I'm in right next door to Sister Lucia's. So I'd wake up in the morning, 9 a.m., I'd go to my meeting, and then 10 a.m. I'd be with Sister Lucia, and then 11 a.m. I'd be with Brother Jude, and then 12 I'd be with Brother uh, Father James, who's now in uh, mm -hmm. Berlin. But Father James was like this. Father James felt like an old sheriff. Right. I don't know if you met you met sure, Father sure, James. Sure, yeah. He's like this. He's like a grandfather. Right. His yeah. hand is enormous. Yeah. He made me feel safe. He would just put his hand on my shoulder sometimes, and he wouldn't say much to me. He wasn't. But he was also like this Archie Bunker character, where like <laughs> his love felt like you had to, like like. You're pulling it out of him. 
Yeah. He's always around. And I started falling into this group and I'm living there. So I'm taking showers in, in there and I'm eating with them and we're hanging out. And, and they're I, drawing you into the, the Christian, the Catholic thing. They're kind yeah. of drawing you into the gospel, into a certain way but of But more life. than that, it's not even like they're trying to, they're drawing me into like laughter. They're like sharing yeah. jokes with me. It's like, we're just like hanging out. And I, at this time, I had no friends in my life. You see, know, I, what, see, what did Jesus do with people when he first met them, typically? He'd eat and drink with them. You know, so you think of Jesus, well, he's giving the Sermon on the Mount. Well, yes, he does. But the typical move of Jesus was, well, let's get around the table and we'll, and we'll talk. Yeah. And he's talking to prostitutes and sinners and tax collectors. And, you know, so that move of theirs, uh, you know, to kind of draw you in. Yeah. Draw you into their life. Yeah. And I'm eating their ice cream. Yeah. And I'm eating them out of house and home. <laughs> and I'm filling the tacos back up. But, uh, like, I'm really, like, I'm... I'm they're not asking nothing of me. They're not asking me to sign nothing. They're not asking me to do nothing or yeah. take pictures. I'm just like sitting around and I'm petting their cats and I'm hanging out, you know? Yeah, right. And, um, and, uh, but the, the lesson of, as you put it, let go was coming through. Yeah. That's and, all I kept but hearing. See, but not just let go, but reach out, right, to someone who's reaching out to you. The reach right. out had happened for me. Yeah. I was already there. I had yeah. nowhere to go. This yeah. was the last stop on the train. There was nowhere else to go. In in every sense. It was like I know now like my God was using my ego to draw me to mm -hmm. him, was drawing me away from worldly desires. It was all happening simultaneously, but there would have been no input impetus for me to get in the car and drive up here if I didn't think, "Oh, I'm going to save my career." And what happened to me when I got here is a switch happened. It was like three card Monty. Mm -hmm. It was like, like, like somebody tricked me into it, yeah. it felt like. Uh, not in a bad way, in a way that like, I couldn't see it. I was, um, I was so close to it, I couldn't, I couldn't see it. Uh, I see it differently now because time has passed. And, um, and, and anyway, so I, I, um, I, I'm hanging with Brother Jude, and then Brother Jude gets called away. And he has to go like, be an archivist somewhere. So he's got no time for me. And another man enters the fray named Brother Alex. And Brother Alex has um, a totally different energy. Young guy, he's about your age. He's my right? age. Yeah. Super austere. Yeah. Uh, very prayerful. Yeah. And I don't know nothing about prayer because I can't cultivate uh, an unforgiving. I, I don't know anything about silence. I don't know anything about quiet. I don't know anything about it. I got a cell phone in my phone that will give me everything my ego needs. It's buzzing all the time. I got all this. You know, I, there is no silence or I don't know anything about meditation. Meditation at this point in my life feels like a self-imposed timeout. Prayer feels like I'm memorizing somebody else's words, like I'm an actor, yeah. like I'm doing monologues for myself in my head. And Alex says, uh, just go into that chapel and just shut up. Where the blessed sacrament is. Yes. Yeah. And just sit there. Just sit right. there and be quiet. And... Um, and, and that feels like a very strange thing to tell me, and I'm also rebelling. And right around this time, you and the deacons show up for like this deacons meeting. Well, that's the first time I met you, It's the first right. time I meet you. Yeah, okay. The deacons are all hanging out at the church. Right, right. And, and I feel like, oh, this is like, wow, I, I, it's amazing I get to sit in here. And you know, my, my, like I feel like, um, like I'm not allowed to be there, and, but then all the deacons are in, like being really warm with me, and I'm sitting in the back. It was mass first, right? It's mass. Then, yeah. We do mass, and then we go like have a little sandwich. Right. And you do this. You do this talk about prayer, yeah. and how it's really a simple uh, four-step process. Prayer, you know, and and I needed somebody to simplify it for me because it felt like one. I needed I needed it to be defined. I didn't want it to be this esoteric. I needed something very defined and very practical. I needed something very like boots on the ground. And you said quiet leads to loving thoughts. Loving thoughts leads to loving action. Loving action leads to peace. And that hit me heavy. And Mother then, Teresa I was quoting there. That's whoever her. it was, it's yeah. changed my life. So then, then you go into pray rosary. Yeah. And I'm just learning rosary at this time. I, you know, I know the front half. I don't know all the prayers. I, I can do, you know, I can get us get to the middle of the rosary. I don't know the dismount prayers, but, <laughs> but, but I have enough to like. It pauses my head. Yeah. Which I guess what rosary does for a lot of people, it, it makes it tactile. It's a great prayer, right? It takes me out of the cognitive and it puts yeah. me into the physical yeah. it physicalizes it and for somehow somehow that pauses all of my internal non-stop chitter chatter yeah. monologuing of what i want what i need and this animal it in calms me comes the monkey mind that was uh, merton's line that he got from the buddhists actually that the monkey mind's always leaping around yes here here and and it, it calms that it calms that and centers it yeah and makes me feel present 
because yeah. it's right here. Right. I can it's, hold you it. You hold it in your hand. Yeah. Right. And so we're praying the rosary, and I'm waiting for loving thoughts, and it's not my first or second or third or fourth or fifth or sixth or seventh thought. But then I hear a thought like, call your mother, tell her you love her. Now, me and my mother at this time, my mother don't want nothing to do with me. You mm -hmm. know, the, the news that had come out has been like I've been abusive to women, and I've been shooting dogs, and I've been willingly giving women STDs, and like there's, it's disgusting. It's depraved. And my mother is embarrassed beyond all imagination. She doesn't want nothing to do with me. And we hadn't talked. And I'm living in this parking lot. And, and I get out of rosary with you and I call my mother. And, um, and I say, uh, I don't have much to say to you, but I love you and I'm safe. And she said, oh, I'm so grateful. Hmm. And she hangs up the phone. And it's the first time I had really like talked to my mother. And I felt this peace. Because I had all this resentment and animosity. Like, how could you dip on me? You're my mother. You know, no matter what happens, like, this is conditional love that you offer me. So, you know, uh, then I start reading the confessions by Augustine and his mother mm. and that relationship. Yeah, and like, right. everything starts to feel like click, 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 click. Right. And Augustine being like a hedonist who had made all these yeah. flaws. And then, then they start explaining Francis to me and all this ego that was yeah. in Francis. Yeah. Just a complete ego Same maniac. Right. Yeah, like, and, and I start feeling all these connections and I start seeing this route. And, the, 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 and it says, let go. And, and, and I, like I find a, a way for myself. This is all before we're even in the movie. I'm not even reading the script yet. I'm just like, it's like laying the ground, laying, laying, not even in a P.O. yet. I'm passing P.O.'s statue every day and I'm kissing him on the hand just out of like <laughs> reverence for the statue. Yeah. But I don't know anything about the man yet. Then I get to reading about P.O. and about suffering. Now, this is another hack that happens to me at some point where I felt like my suffering was pointless. I didn't understand what was going on. I felt like, you know, um, like I, and Father James walks me through like offering your suffering up as, yeah, as a purposeful, right. as right. like intrinsically valuable, right. that God taps certain people right. to go through certain suffering so that they can be more effective at bringing the good news forward. And we start talking about purpose. And I'm, I'm questioning like what my purpose is, because before this moment, my purpose was just to be a good actor. My purpose was just to be the best actor. That was my whole purpose in life, like just such a little dream, like the dream of an ant. Yeah. And um, and James says, you know, what are you good at? And I'm like, I, I'm good at like I'm good at like bleeding in front of people. He's like, what are you talking about? I was like, well, that's what I do. You know, I'm, yeah. I sort of just throw myself at walls. They film me. People tell me it's good. That's all I know how to do. He's like, OK, so you're good at suffering. How are you going to help other people with that? Hmm. I was like, oh, I guess I make movies and stuff. And he's like, yeah, but what else? And um, we start getting deep off in this conversation and what the arithmetic of purpose is. And James says, you find out what you're good at. First, you find out how you can help other people with that, and that is your purpose. Yeah, and that's the leapfrog, right? I mean, there's so many spiritual principles that you're talking about, and it was, what's cool to me is you were learning them not abstractly, not from a book. You were you were living through them, and you had some good people guiding you. But you know, one of them is the whole attachment detachment thing, which every spiritual master talks about. I mean, ancient, medieval, modern, every master is you got to hunger for God. We all do which is infinite hunger. It's what everybody wants. Yeah. Sam Harris wants it, trust mm -hmm, me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but we hook it on to something in the, this world. So we say it's gonna be its wealth, its power, its pleasure, it's my career, it's whatever it is, it's gonna make me happy. And of course it can't because the desire is infinite. So it can't be filled up yeah. by anything. Yeah, the there's world. no ceiling. Right, so you keep throwing things in more and more and more and more. And of course it doesn't work and that's how we get addicted, which is I think why attachment in the classical uh, spiritual masters is very much like addiction today that we know a lot about that we get addicted to these things and it, you know you're addicted to sex or to or to booze or to drugs or to success or to my yeah, own yeah. ego all exactly. that stuff you know so you would you would wander down that path I was wearing the, the success mask for 30 yeah. years and, and but see it's it's like the um did you ever see this thing it was Jim Carrey it was a really funny little routine he did it was at the Golden Globes and he gets up and he said this is not just Jim Carrey speaking to you this is two-time Golden Globe winner yeah. Jim Carrey and then he said what I dream about at night is that someday I will be three-time Golden Globe winner and then the quest will be over and yeah. they all laugh but it was perfect it was yeah. a perfect little parody of yeah. that problem yeah. you know yeah so you're in there and I'm thinking of Chesterton you know GK Chesterton have you read oh, him yeah. at all he has that wonderful line from one of his father Brown stories you know these detective stories and that God will let us drift to the end of the world, but then by a twitch upon the thread, will call us back, you know? And so you're talking about having wandered a long way, but then this twitch on the thread came, and it was this whole weird Padre Pio 
yeah. movie. And then these people yeah. whom I know, everyone you're talking about, I know these guys very well. And and strangely, they weren't trying to get something out of you. I mean, no. you had nothing to really offer no, them. Nothing to offer them. But they they were just there to say, okay, you know, we're going to draw you into our world here just by our friendship and laughter. Then we're going to draw if you it, a little If they bit. didn't do it for fun and for free, I'd have never heard anything they said. I wouldn't right. have heard word one. Right. Because uh, I would have ripped them apart because, oh, this is a transaction and you're doing it because of this and that and this and that. Yeah, uh, like Father James, who I know very well, if someone said, oh, this guy, he's a really famous actor and, you know, if you get to, he's like, ah, I don't care. I've he didn't, he, he was, yeah, he didn't like, care at all. He wouldn't care at no, all. No, he didn't care at all. No, but, and that's what, <laughs> what made him a powerful. Uh, yes. And what he said to you, that see, that's the move now from addiction and then we, we get, we reach out to the Lord, not to the things of the world. But then the next move is always mission. So he's like, okay, why did he call you back with a twitch upon the threat? Yeah. Why? So that now he can send you out on mission. You know? yeah. So that's James saying to you, okay, what are you good at? Well, how can you use it? Yes. You know? But James is also a big PO guy. Right. And he keeps saying to me, like, don't make him weak. Yeah. Like, meek oh, yeah. and weak are two different things. No, right. And let me explain the difference to you between being meek and being weak. Meek yeah, is well, to be well, treasured. Yeah. Meek is to be valued. Meek is a submissive respect. Mm -hmm. Weak is having no faith. And he starts explaining stuff like that to me where, you know, meek in my head from a kid who never had a puberty ceremony. I mean, you know, Judaism and you're 13 and they put you on a chair and you get a driver's license. But it's not like I wander off into the woods and come back with a lion's head. You know, there's no puberty ceremony for a young man today. And that's, that's a problem in our culture. Yes. We, we've forgotten how to do that. And you don't really know what, what, what it is to be a man, you know. And, and he's, he starts, James starts talking about mountains. You know, this is where Seven Story Mountain comes about, but we yeah, were in a okay. conversation about a mountain, about what in nature is masculine. And I'm like, uh, uh, and he says mountain. And he says, do you know why? He goes, because it's immovable. You know, the wind is not going to move a mountain. And, and then we start talking about my wife and my, what, what my wife wants in a man and, and being stable and where that stability comes from for a man. And that it's not going to be something you will. It's mm. going to be something you lean on. And yeah. that mountain is in that chapel. This is like my journey to this. He starts I mean, he making it back to the Blessed Sacrament. Yeah, and, but yeah. he does it like through this rah rah cowboy talk. <laughs> you know, I feel like I'm listening to like, um, uh, like I don't know, I don't know what to describe it as, but it feels like John Wayne. It's like this this rah rah kind of thing that touched on the, it. Kind of it touched on this thing that I came from, and it 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 accounted for this whole side of this Christ that I didn't know yet. And he sort of like masculinized the whole thing for me as this warrior's journey. And he starts saying, he starts reading like Heraclitus to me. <laughs> I don't know anything about Heraclitus, but he's like, there's this quote I want to read to you. And he goes, you know, Heraclitus talks about the kind of, the, what a warrior is. He says, and I'm paraphrasing, but he says, you know, uh, of out of 100 men, 80 are just targets. Uh, 10 are fighters because they, uh, 10 are, are fighters because they, they make for the battle and we're grateful for them. But ah, but the one, the one is a warrior and he will bring the others back. Hmm. And, you know, I'm, I'm starting to have like emotional experiences with this guy in this, you know, with these cats running around, we're eating ice cream. <laughs> and I'm having like emotional experiences with him explaining Heraclitus and like this, this, um, this thing that I hadn't had before, which felt um, like a task more than me, more than just like myself. And it was also like tapping into this other program that I come from. And so now I'm starting to share, like, in this other program on Zoom, like, these guys are seeing me in a parking lot, and they're seeing these friars walk behind me. <laughs> and, what's going on? And they're, they're desperate for God over here as well. You yeah. know, that, that whole thing is about finding a higher power. Um, and so they're seeing me, like, hang out at this seminary, and they start driving up. And the guys start... Is that right? Yeah, these guys <laughs> that are in this other program start driving up to the seminary yeah. and start hanging out with these other friars, and my world sort of connect, sort of collides. And then, um, uh, oh man, where where are we in the story? But but um, we've well, come a long way spiritually at that point. Yes, I mean you've now you've made now some... I'm really like now I'm experiencing prayer. I'm yeah. experiencing rosary. Uh, I'm starting to learn mass really well. I'm starting to be a part of mass. I'm starting to feel the effect of mass. I'm not receiving the host yet because um, we weren't sure if I was baptized or not, and so I couldn't receive yet. And I felt this deep longing. I didn't know I was baptized. I had been baptized earlier in my life and didn't even remember right? it. Yeah. My, my uncle was a, uh, 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 had, had baptized me in uh, Trinity, uh, um, uh, 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 Trinitine, uh, I'm saying it wrong. Uh, Trinitarian formula? Yes, the... yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, and so, I, so then we found out that I could receive Mass and started receiving Mass and I start feeling like this um, 
deep reprieve. It's not just this like, it's not just like a cracker anymore. I start feeling like, um, I start feeling a physical effect from it. I start feeling a reprieve and it starts feeling like regenerative. And, um, and I, and I start, um, enjoying it to such a degree. I don't want to miss it ever. And then I start going to other masses in different parts of the city. I wind up at San Lorenzo, um, and, and, uh, doing liturgy, the hours with them, which feels like a bigger version of what I'm experiencing in yeah. uh, Santa Inez at mass. I'm feeling it even, I'm feeling more reprieve, feeling safety, which is really what I'm chasing, like this safety. And I'm feeling it with these brothers. And I start feeling like this, this fraternity start to build around me. And then I start telling Abel, like, I got to bring all of these guys with me. And he's like, well, we can't do that. Pick one. And, and I don't know who to pick. And so I go, to, um, um, I go to the head of the novitiate and I ask him to pick. And he picks Alex. Oh, and that's how Alex ended up. That's how Alex it. falls yeah, okay. in. And so then, then they write a role for Alex. And then me and Alex wind up going to Italy. And he's in the film he's quite in the a movie, bit, actually. Yeah, yeah he's, he's my right-hand man. Right. I mean, in life and in the film. Yeah. And he, what he brings with him is like, it's like a, he's like, he's like a walking, um, he's like a, I don't know how to describe him. He's, he's my inroad into Catholicism. He was the guy who eskimo me in, pretty much. And continues to be the guy who, I can text him about anything, you know? And he's also a really good uh, mediator between me and my director. Um, because I'm not an expert in Catholicism, but I have one with me who's really good at, at being diplomatic with two creatives. He doesn't have this like energy. He has yeah. a very, he's like water. I, yeah. I don't know how to describe it, but, but um, he's, he's, he's very diplomatic. And so, I mean, by this time, you've moved a long way from being on, on fire in that negative sense. When you say you were really- I'm not feeling that anymore. Yeah. Now I'm feeling like quite driven. And it was, I'm trying to let's name some of the moments. It was the way these guys included you in their community is one thing. It's yes. reading the gospel. Yes. You started reading things like the Seven Story Mountain. Yes. You're spending time in front of the Blessed Sacrament, right? Jim Townsend, uh, Brother Jim yeah, Townsend no. also gave me permission to, as a sinner to feel like, well, yeah. okay. I hadn't sinned like that. And he was a Capuchin. So it made me feel like, okay, well, me too. Like, uh, you know, I, I'm involved in this conversation. Yeah. It was, it was seeing other people who had sinned beyond anything I could even conceptualize also being found in Christ that made me feel like, okay, well, that, that gives me hope. Yeah. And James said, hope is... H-O-P-E, hearing other people's experiences. Hmm. And I, that, it's the truth for me. I started hearing experiences of other like depraved people who had found their way in this and it made me Which feel like I had classic permission. classic form in the spiritual tradition, going back to people like Augustine, you know. Augustine, who was, I mean, he was lost. It's the same thing. I mean, he yeah. reached a point in his life. What, what he was obsessed with was uh, fame. I mean, in, in a way, like, like you, yep. he wanted a great career. Yep. He was this rhetorician. He wanted to be the speechwriter for the emperor, which indeed he, he became. And then that famous story, remember in the Confessions when he's going to accompany the emperor as he's going to you know, recite one of Augustine's mm. own speeches, mm -hmm. the high point of his life. And they run into this poor drunken guy in the street. Mm. You know, let's carry on. And Augustine oh, looks at him with disgust. And then he realizes, you know, yeah, I mean, tomorrow he'll be sober, but I'm still going to be completely drunk yeah. on ambition. Yeah. And it, it, yeah. it led him down that same sort of hellish path until it was Ambrose. See, Ambrose for him was sort of like Father James or Brother Alex for you. There was this great bishop in, in Milan, and it was his preaching. And here Augustine's, Augustine went to hear him because he heard his rhetoric was impressive. Mm -hmm. I'm going to hear mm -hmm. this guy. Mm -hmm. he, he's mm -hmm. a great you know, user of the Latin language. But as he listened to him, he's also preaching the, the spiritual life. Mm -hmm. right? And so Augustine... Uh, and tears had a lot to do with it. Augustine was like a hyper intellectual, but man, there's like tears on every page of the Confessions. Yeah, and he starts weeping as he yeah. listens to uh, Ambrose. You know, yeah. so that's a story from so many centuries ago. But it's your story in many ways. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, yeah, and I'm I'm experiencing a lot of that also. But also, it, it, the weird thing is is like separating. What if this is actually happening to me for me, and what if this is like Po and this film and preparation and the separation, you know, I, I'm, I, I, before this movie, I'm chasing no separation, but here it felt even further. And there was a certain point where Abel's like asking me to do an accent. And yeah, you didn't do an accent. No, you just spoke no, in your American. Yeah, because at a certain point, like I prayed on it, you yeah. know, and I thought this is the separation I'm not after. This feels like, like, okay, now I'm just like wearing a mask, like a PO mask. Yeah, right. Whereas um, it felt like the task wasn't that. The task, 
even beyond what the director was asking of me. And he found a way to find the same kind of, uh, he found my reasoning just, was that I was having like genuine, while we were practicing Latin mass, I was having genuine emotional experiences. Mm -hmm. And be, aside from the fact that, you know, as a, a Neapolitan speaker, his accent would have matched Italian anyway. But it felt like I, 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 that would have taken me out of this yeah, thing right. that felt very personal. And um, so we didn't do an accent because I felt like what was happening to me was like, uh, like some kind of vessel. I'm not going to get too cheesy about it, but it felt like, um, like I, wasn't, it was, I wasn't in control of a lot, a lot of the stuff that was happening. There wasn't a whole lot of like emotional actor prep. It was like very prayerful. When I felt like I couldn't hit a moment, I would, me and Alex would like, we would pray. And then it would come, like the emotion would just come. Pio was a very emotional guy. Yeah. A very, a very, um, and, and, and mass is very technical. It's so technical. And so it's very difficult. You have to be very proficient at Latin mass, one. So I spent most of my time not even studying Pio. I would just study Latin mass. So I went up to Oakland. I lived in Oakland and just uh, with, with the, at the seminary um, in Burlingame. Uh, and then in Oakland, and I'm just going to Latin Mass all the time. And then after Latin Mass, I'm studying with the, the priests from the uh, Christ the King, which is traditionalist Latin Mass, and I'm studying with them, but there's no emotionality with them. They're very like, yeah, it's like right. French Latin Mass, which isn't <laughs> Italian Latin Mass. It's very like, it's yeah. just like stiff. Mm -hmm. Peel wasn't stiff. Peel was, like you say, he was a, almost a dancer. And so you're trying to like build this Mass that Peel is known for, It'd be like playing Dylan and not knowing how to play guitar. Mm -hmm. Like if you want to play Dylan, you don't just read Dylan biographies. Right. You have to pick a guitar up and you have to learn how to play a guitar. And then the guitar needs to be your best friend. And then you need to sleep with the guitar. Mm -hmm. And then the guitar needs to be your, your only travel companion. Yeah. That's the way into Dylan. Right. The way into Pio was mass. And it wasn't until I felt like I started having emotional reactions in mass that I feel like I was anywhere near playing Pio. And mass got very emotional. Like really, really, really emotional. And then I felt like, okay, now I, now I have permission to go study Pio. So then the Pio study started and that took us to Italy. Then I started going to where he studied in San Giovanni Rotundo and you see it and, and something was offsetting about it because what I knew of Pio to that point was like, this is a man of deep humility who's offering up his suffering. And you walk into uh, 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 San Giovanni and you see this big mosaic of this man and there's pictures of him watching them build it. And my first inroad in to what James was talking about offering your suffering up and offering your ego up and entirely is I always pictured a priest would be so uh, against the idea that he's being put on this Mount Rushmore in this town. And what I'm seeing in this man is like deep utility, deep focus, like a, a man who's just so laser beam focused. He doesn't care if you think he's ridiculous. He doesn't care if the church thinks he's ridiculous. He doesn't care. Which it did for a long time. Which for a that, long that's time. part of the drama of Padre Pio. Right? Which was that's another inroad for me. Basically 10 years. Exile. The church said, you know. Don't just, celebrate mass. Right. Sit in this room. And you know, by the end of his life, he's this living saint. And now he's this, you know, the, one of the great saints of the 20th century. But during his lifetime. Yeah. He, he went through a real. Uh, dark Psychological and spiritual suffering. With not much to lean on, other right. than like his a few spiritual advisors and, and people who he would celebrate mass out of his window, because he wasn't allowed in the church anymore. Yeah. He wasn't allowed out of his room anymore. When you go to San Giovanni Rotundo, um, there's his room, and then there's a chapel, a small little chapel the size of this table that they built for him. There's like five chairs in there. Yeah, that's where he would celebrate mass for like ten years, and he would open a window and he would celebrate mass, and he would hear the crowd outside, and it felt like this, you know, and not to minimize Pio, but or, 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 or aggrandize myself, but this is another inroad for me where, where exiled, you're nuclear, mm -hmm. you're, a, you're a depraved individual, you're disgusting, we don't want nothing to do with you anymore. And I'm feeling that in Pio, because this is what the church said to him as well. Um, you know, uh, uh, you're doing it wrong. You're a no-no. You're persona non grata. I think they weren't sure what to do with him. I think they, they were just thrown off. Like, like what is this? Well, and it, it took him a long time to figure him when out. When he I claimed think. stigmata, the church at the time sent a bunch of rationalist, <laughs> unbelieving people who thought miracles were impossible and we were beyond the age of miracles. Yeah. And he's got his hands wrapped and they're saying, let me see. And he's saying no. And then they write him off. You're a liar. 
Yeah. You're a liar and you're using the church to sensationalize and create a spectacle out here so you can sell keychains or whatever they thought they was doing, you know? And um, so they, they write him off yeah. as a crazy, as a lunatic, a, a person who is, who is pimping the church is what mm -hmm. they thought. Um, and he had genuinely experienced something. Which is true of a lot of the mystics too. They, they, the church has a hard time taking them in at first and it, it takes a, a while to figure them out. Um, but no, I like how though you're using that though as a way into your own yes. life experience. Yes, because again, I, I'm feeling all this deep identification. Like here's another example of a man who, when he was exiled, he didn't hit Twitter. Right. He didn't go on Twitter and say, I didn't do this, I he didn't do that. Did it, right. He just got quiet. Yeah. He got quiet and he said, is that so? And then he continued doing what, yeah. what, what served him and, his, and the people that he was serving. He didn't get loud. He didn't do the Martin Luther. He did the St. Francis. Mm -hmm. which was he quietly got more Christ-like yeah. and cultivated that as opposed yeah. to like this rebellion. He that, accepted it. Yeah, he accepted the judgment it. Of the church. Yeah, he could have started his own church, started his own order. Right. He right. had that much following. Right. He could have at that moment walked off into the woods and created his entire, a whole new sect of, of Catholicism. Right. And there are a lot of people in the tradition who did things just like that. You know, probably mystics who had some legitimate sense of God, but they didn't keep communion with the church. Yes. You know? But let's go back to the, Stigmata for a second, because I don't want to give away too much of the movie, but it is featured in the movie that Padre Pio bore in his own body the wounds of Jesus, yeah. right? And you could say from a distant perspective, like, oh, wow, that's really something. It's kind of glamorous, you know? <laughs> but, but he took it for what it was. I mean, that, it, it, this enormous suffering. Yeah. Uh, they hurt, you know, literally. These were yeah. wounds that yeah. hurt. And the idea is... He was identified with the suffering of Jesus, which is a suffering that redeemed the world, you know? Yeah. And this very deep mystery is precisely through our pain, very often. Yeah. That we, that, that we find salvation, but also we become a vehicle of salvation to others, right? And so, I mean, you're talking about your own pain in your this life. This is why when I said to James, you know, he's like, what are you good at? Yeah, right. I'm like bleeding in front of people. Yeah, right. And then I start looking at Pio. <laughs> yeah. And it's genuinely what, what was, was going he on. <laughs> he's he's doing mass and he's bleeding in front of people. He's wrapping it up. Yeah. He's not it's not a billboard. Hey, look at my stigma. But it, it, I feel like this deep like identification with a Pio figure. And um and then I start looking at how he moved through the exile, which was to get quiet and cultivate more of the Christ in him. Uh, and that becomes my MO. That's modus operandi. I, and, and it's happening to me while I'm researching. And um, um, uh, yeah, so I'm, 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 I, and I'm, and I'm also getting friendly with people who knew him. You know, he becomes. So you met some who actually knew him. Yeah, people he dies who were, about 1968, right? Yes. So these would be pretty old men. Well, when you go to San Giovanni Rotundo, the, the, the fathers that are there now were yeah. confessing to Pio. Well, wow. so when and, they were young yes. guys, probably. Right? Yeah, and so you walk in and they're like, you're Pio? You know? <laughs> <laughs> and you're feeling all that too, you know? This, you got a little bit of that. Oh like, yeah, they're uh, sizing you up. Yeah. You're, you're dealing with a person who, <laughs> it's not just like their favorite baseball team, you know? Right. You're dealing with, it's, it's uh, big chips on the table. And then they walk you into his corpse. That's right, so he's, he's there. The... Yeah, and it's overwhelming. You yeah. Know? It's like the, the weight of it all, you know? You're standing with a dude who used to confess to this guy. Yeah. And this guy created all this. Yeah. And you're in this town with the third biggest hospital in Italy that this man built out of right. nothing. This place, they used to grow radishes. Now it's got the third biggest hospital, a radiation center at the top. And, you know, they're studying cancer treatments. And it's like, you, you can't even fathom how much was done, how much got done in a very pragmatic sense. Not in an esoteric hoodie do way, in a very, like, feet on the ground, like, in a, in like it feels like lumber. It feels like you can hold it. And you're looking at this and you're feeling this and again, I'm just feeling like this let go, like you got me, you know? And there's, it feels like this, uh, like I'm imbued with this, with this, this, um, this thing. It doesn't require me to do much, you know? It just requires me to get out of the way. And so I just show up on set with that. And these guys are all on set. And now we're doing scenes and the guy who confessed to Pio is by the monitor. It does something. It does he, something. Did he tell you anything that was helpful? Did he say like he did? He, you should do. He, he did. He told me that that um, he told me there was one time where he was confessing, and there was a woman in the hallway who was wearing a dress that had her ankles exposed. Yeah. And he, when he opened, he had somebody send her away, and he said, uh, 
he told me about different teachers that he had in his life. The, the father who I was with was um, a little bit blind. He had vision problems. And he told me about this teacher who, in the seminary, he told me about two big teachers for him. One was a man who bought him really big books so he could see better. Yeah. And the other was, was Pio, who had failed him mm. in his seminary. He used to teach the kids. Oh, Pio had <laughs> teach the kids. Yeah. Uh, Pio uh, would catechize the youth and, and walk them into uh, uh, postulancy. He was the one who was like man on the, man on the ground, dealing with the, the new recruits, as you would say. And uh, they had a curriculum. And you could fail the curriculum if you didn't study. So he was flunked by Pio. He was Pio. flunked by Pio. And this is a blind man, right? So, yes. and he, at first he thought, this is completely heartless. How do you, <laughs> how do you flunk a blind man? And, and, it, and it was as if he heard Pio say, you can do better. Yeah. And it motivated his life. He's now one of the head friars there. You know, uh, one of the most respected, yeah. most beloved old dudes in there. And uh, he sort of also welcomes everybody in. He's, after mass, he, he the same guy I'm talking about, uh, he goes and walks into the laity and he raises his hands and they all come around him and they kneel around him in a circle and he prays for everybody. They love him. The whole neighborhood loves him. Um, but he was the one who said, you know, the two teachers that matter to me was this, this really giving, soft approach yeah. that identified like my problem and like um, was soft with me, bought me the big books. And then there was this PO influence, which was holding me to account. He and had tough. big Yeah, he had certain ambitions. He was tough. To, to flunk a blind guy and tell him, <laughs> I, you can do better. Yeah. It requires a certain kind of um, a person who can see more in you than you can even see in yourself. And so he, this is kind of the energy that he had. And so there's scenes in the movie that, you know, you know with him cursing and confessional and stuff like that, that, you know, uh, James really loves. You know, Father James loves those scenes because yeah. they, they introduce a certain... He was tough in the confessional for sure. Yeah. That, there's a, that's well attested, right? They didn't take a lot of guff in the confessional. No. Like, if someone's playing around like, yeah. Father, here are my sins, and, and yeah. Padre Pio knew, come on. If you had work. come in four times with the same issue, he wasn't going to even listen to you anymore. He would yeah. just send you away, and you'd hear him yelling from confessional as you were waiting to go into confessional. <laughs> and so as you're walking into confessional, yeah. he just let loose on another guy. You know, there's certain, this is the P.O. style of doing things. This Tell was, me about, I mean, because now we're on this theme of, of the tough Padre Pio. Uh, a really striking element of the movie to me are the scenes where he's literally wrestling with the devil. And it's, it's well accounted uh, for in, in the stories of Padre Pio that his brothers would hear this like ruckus up in his room. Yeah. Like, things being thrown around yeah. and the, his body being hurled against a wall. Yeah. And it was... I mean, he, he was wrestling, he was struggling with the devil. Well, broken fingers, bloody noses. Yeah, right. Yeah, he was, he was, he was, in, he was in brawling all night. <laughs> Which he, I know would strike a lot of people today, I'm sure, is beyond bizarre. But you find it in the spiritual tradition like crazy that people who are really close to God, the devil hates them and will go after them. Yeah. And, you know, Padre Pio opened something up that was extraordinarily powerful. And I would say included someone like you. So you go back to 19, you know, 30 something, the young Padre Pio or whatever, 1920. But he had, God had you in mind. I mean, that Padre Pio would reach out to someone like you. Right, and right. So my point there is, of course, the devil hates that. He hates that. And so, of course, he's going to go after that because that's a very powerful moment when grace is breaking into the world, right? And so I, I, I find that very plausible. The older I get, the more plausible I find that. that the devil, of course, wants to go after even in a very direct way, those uh, avenues of grace. Which feels like a suffering hack. Because then you feel like, oh, okay, well, the suffering is actually a gift. Yeah. Like, you, you blessed me with this. When I think about, like, what's happened in my life this way, like, the um, old me when I walked in was so upset about the, you know, so resentful about the woman who accused me of all this. You know, I wanted to go on Twitter and write all these things and I wanted to justify this and explain all this. And now I actually see like the woman saved my life. Hmm. You know, she, she is a, for me, a saint in my life. She saved my life. And that happened, you know, that the perspective switch feels miraculous. Hmm. What a spiritual experience for me is not like talking to a cloud or like when you talk about like the supernatural, um, in my life, it's, it's, it's a change in perspective. Yeah. That feels miraculous to me. There's no other way yeah. I could have done it on my own. So yeah. w when I think about Pio and, and, this, and this fighting in this room, um, uh, yeah, so yeah, it's, it, it feels like, um, like I can't account for his perspective in that room. 
I can't account for yeah. it. It's his journey. It's his thing. And I think about, well, okay, well, what are my personal like fights? Was it physicalized? What and and also did he? There's a question of whether like he he is this is this um, him writing in parable form? You know, did he did right. he genuinely? And I would ask the guys at San Giovanni. What did they say? It was a full blown fist fight. Yeah. No. Yeah. See, the devil is usually more subtle because people at lower levels, you know, of a spiritual order, he tempts and he does all kinds of insinuating things. But I think with the the great saints and the mystics, he's like, I'm coming at you. Yeah. I'm coming at you very directly. So yeah. that, that doesn't really surprise me. There are a lot of stories like that in the great tradition, you know. Um, and Padre Pio was, I mean, he, he opened up this avenue of grace that was extraordinary. So, of course, the devil hated him. You can see, it, when you go, you see there's dents in his room, in yeah, the wall. Right. There's dents in the room, yeah. in the wall. Uh, there's, like, there's like blood marks on the wall. There's yeah. still... You know, they, they, they have preserved this cell to such a degree that, I mean, that's another wild thing to walk into. They still have his heart in a crystal box. You know, this is really like, that's, I guess, another thing that I love about Catholicism. It takes me out of like all this cognitive, um, like I have to do this fairy tale make-believe and it puts it right there like I can touch it. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't need to wonder whether a saint exists when I'm looking at his heart, when I'm looking yeah. at his when, there, when you have all these talismans of like what is actual like physical mana of what was there, for a person who's as caveman as I am in terms of I need a Polaroid picture, I need a Polaroid picture of God. Yeah. Catholicism offers it to me. You know, it gives well, me Polaroid pictures. It's the incarnation, right? I mean, the, in Jesus, we find the face of God. And uh, right, so the, the appeal to the mind, but also, I mean, to the heart, the body, the emotions. And then that's carried on through the great tradition for sure. Uh, and that's the saints, right? The, that's why we keep relics. I mean, it's a yeah. it's a prolongation in a way of the principle of the incarnation that the word becomes flesh. And so in yeah. the flesh of the saints, you know, I mean, I've got a Padre Pio um, relic back in my chapel. You know, someone gave me years ago. And uh, I mean, it's powerful stuff. Yeah. This is the other thing is you, you start like, I, I'm blessed to have had the experience I've had because um, once I met all the caps in Italy, then they introduced me all the caps in Rome. Yeah, and then when you, when you go to Rome, and you go to the you know, the head of the order has a room that is full of relics that is overwhelming. It's just it's just you cannot deny. Did you go to the Bone Church in yes, Rome? Yes, yes, <laughs> yeah. This type of stuff is like it. it um, yeah, it, it's just so effective. It's just so effective. It just um, it's really hard, and it's also like. Trying to describe it to my buddies over here, it's like trying to describe what pizza tastes like. I can't. Right. I can't describe to you what pizza tastes like. You got to either put pizza in your mouth. No, but they, they'll they see something in you, though. See, they'll see the, the change. Exactly. And so Jesus says, you know, uh, metanoia is his first word. You know, uh, we say repent, but it means go beyond the mind you have. That's what it means literally. So noose is mind, meta is beyond. So he's saying go beyond the, the mind. And so the mind that we all get stuck in is this one of fill it up, fill up the ego with all these things. You got to get beyond that mind. And as you put it, reach out because the central theme of the Bible, you could say, Old Testament and New, is trust, trust in the Lord. Because yeah. our word for that would be faith, you know. And before that means something more cognitive, it means something more visceral. It means trust. Let go, as you say, let go of all that old thing. Let go of that old self, which has made you miserable, right? And trust, the kingdom of God is at hand, Jesus says, and that means he's at hand. Here I am. Trust in me. Reach out to me, you know. And that's Christianity. I mean, that's that's Catholicism. But it's so irrational to just trust. Yeah, you know, right. I, I can't just jump from nothing to faith. Because I, I'm convinced I need all those things to be happy, and so I, I hang on to them desperately. If I let go of my career, or let go of pleasure, or I let go of power, whatever it is, I'm not going to be, I'm, I'm going to be lost, you know. But that sounds like Peter walking on the water. Uh, you know, as long as he's looking at the Lord, he's able to walk on the water. But you're looking around. Yep. You know, it's in the fear. You know, perfect love casts out not hate, the Bible says, but all fear, right? Perfect love casts mm. out all fear. Mm. And that's a very important move. I'm, I'm afraid. I, I'm afraid to let go. Let go. Perfect love, right? The love that comes from God and is directed back to God casts out all fear. And then then, see, you start glowing with it. So you're not on fire the way you were describing, like in this hellish fire, but now you start glowing with this, this light, which is, I receive a grace and I give it. Instead of saying, hey, I got something, I'm going to get more of that. Mm. No, no, no. What you get, 
give it, and then you'll get more of it. It didn't make any sense to me that God comes to those who, um, who give. I, I, that's not what I was told in, the, in, in before I came in. I, uh, God comes. I came from the school of God helps those who helps themselves. Mm -hmm. That's what I was told, yeah. and that's not what I found. God comes to those who give, those who ask. That's what I've experienced. I didn't do any of this. This, this is so. When you talk about like, oh, what's your school of acting and stuff? Like, I don't know. I have no idea. I showed up for this movie, and there'd be scenes that I, you know, we would do, be doing mass, and right before I would do mass, uh, you know, I turn to Alex and I say, "Brother, I love you," and um, he'd say, "I love you," and that'd be that. That'd be all the prep I need. You know, I, old me used to like live on a set. You know, I would like live in a tank. Yeah. And I'd be living in the tank and like oh, and doing all this extra it. like yeah. extra blah 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 because I was so scared that I wasn't going to get it right that I didn't want to leave any room for error. I had no faith in anything other than my own will and my own efforts. And then you get to this set and it's, it's um you can only go so far and then you really do have to have faith because you're you're it's not like you're um you're not playing anything you can actually rationalize. Action, you're fighting with the devil. What? <laughs> you know, how do you how do you 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 have to have faith because it feels so and that's the other thing is like it could get so corny mm -hmm. it could just get so garbage and you're desperate to get it right you're desperate to like protect this man's legacy and i remember when i was you know i, I had also been going to other latin mass in van nuys like uh, i'm quite close with mel gibson and when i i didn't know how to get to latin mass i didn't know how to find it you can't like go type it up online and find it and he had, he had uh, introduced me to certain Latin mass, which, because um, uh, he's very into that mm -hmm. traditionalist thing. Um, and uh, he, he uh, you, you walk into like uh, um, that realm and you have people coming up to you once they know that you're playing Pio and you start, they start like coming up to you and, and tugging at your, at your shirt sleeve and saying, don't get it wrong. Yeah. He's the only one we have. You know, you start hearing things like that, you, you go, you ship out with so much pressure yeah. that then you're in front of the mass and you've just gone through six, seven months of the shirt tugging, the introduction to the order, the yeah. introduction of who Pio was, and you're standing in front of the mass that he used to serve mass at, and you're trembling with fear. And there's no way you can actually find the agency that he had and like, and, and you go through all this second guessing that to have Alex with me rooted me in something very tangible and real. And when I turned to Alex and would say, you know, I love you, it felt like God. This is really where, where which re really is God for me. You know, um, art isn't God for me, which is where I used to come from. Yeah. Art, love, and God being synonymous. But God and love are still synonymous for me. And the more loving that I am, the more I feel closer to God. Well, that's what God is, right? So, so I when mean, art reflects Him, yes, you know, the true, the good, the beautiful all reflect Him. But he, what He is is love, and love is willing the good of the other. So that when you do that, you're you are in the presence of God. I mean, you're, the divine life is surging through you when you when you truly will the good of the other, which is a very very rare thing, you know, because we're so tainted by our ego that even as I'm. I think I'm willing that person's good, but but probably there's a lot of because I'll get something out of yeah. it, right? That's why those moments of when you can return to another human being and say, I love you or or demonstrate that, that's a that's a rare thing. That means God is in you, right? Now give that yes. away. Keep giving that away and you'll get more of it. And you'll get more of it. And that's that's the saints live in that place. Um but that's Which is very, difficult on a film set. Yeah, I imagine. When the camera is on you. Right. It's so easy to get lost in ego when the camera is on you. Right. It's actually, it takes extraordinary effort to get out. I mean, forget the camera for a second. I wake up in it. My left is my left. My right is my right. You are in front of me. You know, it takes extraordinary effort and um, it takes real work to get to another perspective uh, if I don't have a higher power. If I don't have God, you know, uh, if I don't have Freedom doesn't feel good with no structure. You know, if somebody stripped me naked and threw me in the ocean, it wouldn't feel good. I'd be free, but I wouldn't enjoy it. Um, this has given me structure to be able to enjoy my freedom, to be able to, it's yeah. given me, yeah, it's given me purpose, the structure of it. What I need you, the structure of it. Bob Dylan, freedom just around the corner from you, but with truth so far off, what good would it do? Well, let's go down the Bob Dylan route for a second. <laughs> 
No, because I mean, see, he speaks a lot of these truths, you know, because Dylan comes out of that tradition. But but that's exactly it. So we, we can so valorize freedom as like spontaneity. I do whatever I want. But with truth so far off, what good would it do? I mean, freedom is always correlated. to. Can truth. you say the lyric one more time? Freedom just around the corner from you. But with truth so far off, what good would it do? That's from Joker Man. Remember Fire. that from like the early uh, 80s? No, you're a deep cuts Dylan guy. I'm yeah. like a big hits Dylan guy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm both. You know, I, I started loving Bob Dylan when I was about 13. And it was the concert for Bangladesh. Remember that? No, uh, no, no. 1971, no, no. George Harrison organized one of the very first benefit concerts. Now, now that's so commonplace, but it was like the first one. For Bangladesh had gone through a great flood, right? All these people that were suffering. So he organized this concert. Everybody, Eric Clapton, uh, Ringo, I mean, everybody at the time was there. And then the climactic moment was that he brought up Bob Dylan, mm -hmm. who sang like five of his most classic songs. And he had been out of uh, commission for a while. People hadn't seen him. And I, that was the first record I heard of Bob Dylan was that performance. And it just, I was like 13 or 14. And it just changed my life. Can I tell you Bob Dylan's story? Yeah. I made a movie called Honey Boy about my dad. Yeah, right. And um, Neil Young was a big deal for me and my dad. Love Neil, Neil Young. Neil Young. Yeah. Um, and, and we didn't have like the budget. We were a small little like $3 million movie, really tiny uh, film. And we didn't have like the money to pay for this Neil Young song that um, was, a, was a big deal for me and my dad. And I wrote this letter to Neil Young and asked him for the song. And he sent me a price tag that was exorbitant and would have been our whole budget. So then um, I reach out to my dad and my dad plays me this Dylan song called All I Want to Do Is, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if that's called that, but it's Baby the, Be Friends With Baby Me. Baby Be Friends With yeah. Me. And uh, I send the same letter to Dylan and he gives me the song for free. Oh, is that right? Yeah, for free. Pretty good. Yeah, for free. Nobody would do this. N nobody would do that. I mean, wow. he, yeah, he's such a champion of the arts, like such a giving guy. I don't know if everybody knows that about Dylan, like the way that he moves in the industry or in business, like... He's, he's, uh, he gives a lot of his music away to other, like, um, bubbling artistic endeavors. He yeah. just freely gives it away, which I think says a lot about who the guy is. Well, he's, he's not far from here. He lives in Malibu, you know. So Does he? Yeah, that's where his, his main house is. I think he has a farm in Minnesota, too. Yeah, I picture him living in a chicken coop or something like that. Yeah, he lives in a, in a well, I think he does have kind of a strange, <laughs> pictures I've seen, like the environment around his house. It's kind of like a farm. Got to be. But, uh, oh, no, I mean, Bob Dylan, because the thing with Dylan, he, he does, I mean, so many different things and different styles, but he's someone that knows the spiritual tradition pretty well because he's biblical. Yeah. The Bible from the beginning to end, from the earliest stuff, hard rain and all that, all the way to today is the Bible, I think, is the great golden thread that runs through his writing. Well, and as a blues guy, you can't really get into lead belly and guys like that unless you're into the Bible. Oh, the blues is all the Bible. It's all Bible. Yeah, and, and so that whenever you get into kind of Americana music like that, it's going to be... Uh, the Bible is yeah. the thing. But see, people have forgotten the Bible, though. They, they don't know the Bible. The way people in the 19th century, or even like Dylan's generation, the first part of the 20th century, most Americans had a pretty good acquaintance with it. Now they don't. Um, What's the solution for that? What no, that's, do you... no, that's a good question. And I, I just finished a commentary on the about half the Old Testament. That's part of what I'm really dedicated to, is trying to make the Bible better known. And a lot of my the preaching that I do... Uh, People say, well, it's remarkable because you're talking about the Bible so often. Well, what else would you talk about? But for a long time, we didn't. A lot of our preaching wasn't biblical. So um, I'm dedicated to, you know, making that sense. Meaning you were encouraged not to talk Bible? Kind of. We were encouraged to talk about people's experiences. So In homilies. Uh, yeah. Like to say, you know, the Bible's kind of too heady or it's too strange or it's this distant thing. So talk about, you know, your experience, how it relates to their experience, and maybe bring in a little something from the Bible. And that was a disaster. I mean, uh, to be honest with you, like my generation was trained to preach that way, and it was disastrous. The Bible is so much more interesting than my experience. Yes. And, and when I bring my experience to the Bible, mm. you know, and say, well, my world belongs in that world, right? My world should be drawn up into that world. That makes it more compelling, I think. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. I, I find that's, I guess, why traditionalist mass hits me from a different angle. There's not like this relatable. Like the homily doesn't like okay we'll let our we'll let our we'll, we'll let the like tss, all the right. all the air goes out of mass when 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 that part of mass happens when we we've done a very prayerful we entered it's very prayerful uh, the, the the initial prayers and, and then you we get to the homily and like there's this tss. right 
Well, that happens when it's your it's the priest kind of own words and own experience dominating. Now, you know, obviously they are my words, and of course my experience will influence it, but when that comes to dominate... To let your hair down right before you're asking me to fully believe that we're about to walk through the death of Christ yeah, seems like, huh? They should be Christ's words, right? So the, the homily is an extension of the gospel, and it should be Christ's words that you're preaching. If it's just... If it's you know Bob Barron sharing his private spiritual intuitions with you, well then who cares? You know that's I might do that at a at a cocktail party or something. But yeah. at mass, it's the prolongation of the gospel. That's what the homily is. But the, but the irony is, the more I do that, the more compelling the preaching is, and, and the more it reaches people. If it's Christ's words, it's the Bible that dominates. You know. Yes. <laughs> hey, listen, I could talk to you all day. Yeah, I was just thinking that myself. But. Uh, Thank you for being here, and it was just delightful. And, uh, you know, my feeling, honestly, is is Padre Pio from his heavenly place. Uh, just as those Capuchins kind of took you in, you know, up in San Lorenzo, drew you into their company and more deeply into their life. Because we believe it's not just that company we can see, but the one that we can't see. And uh, that company, too, of the saints reaches out to us and I think played a role in drawing you in. You know? For sure. And so you're playing Padre Pio. I see it as a result of of his intervention, you know, in your life from his heavenly place. So, praise God for that. Praise God for that. <laughs> Thanks for letting me sit down with you. All right. God bless you, Shay. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Peace. Peace.